not all people of color experience racism differently. The things I've internalized about different groups is different. Uh, where and how they are positioned always in relation to whiteness or far away from whiteness and how that manifests, right? All of that must be understood. Um, but after a good 20 plus years of talking day in and day out to white people about racism, I feel very confident to say that there is something profoundly anti-black in this. Mm. Um, racism is a system, not an event. And it's the system we're in. And none of us could be and none of us were exempt from its forces. But the way we're taught to think of racism functions beautifully to not only obscure the system, but to exempt us from its forces, right? or to have us uh, believe we are exempted from its forces. Now, as a white person, I was raised to be racially illiterate, and I, I actually think all white people are raised to be racially illiterate um, in this culture. And in gaining racial literacy, uh, I have had to understand not just the collective dynamics and dimensions of racism, but how racism uh, impacts different groups who are perceived and defined as people of color, how it yeah, impacts them differently. Right? So not all peoples of color experience racism differently. The things I've internalized about different groups is different. Uh, where and how they are positioned always in relation to whiteness or far away from whiteness and how that manifests, right? All of that must be understood. Um, but after a good 20 plus years of talking day in and day out to white people about racism, I feel very confident to say that there is something profoundly anti-black in this culture. And that nothing seems to turn white people's cranks of resentment, like thinking black people got something over on us that they didn't deserve. And, and the deeper uh, belief is that they're inherently undeserving. I believe in the in the white mind, black people are the ultimate racial other, right? And that there are these bookends. And again, your perceived proximity to each end of that impacts how you're going to experience uh, your racialization. So having said that, and, and um, not really having time to do history, I just want to give you one glance at the trajectory of anti-blackness in this, in this country since its beginning, and this slide will be deliberately dense. We can literally think about it as state-sanctioned, organized crime, but at least discrimination against African Americans from the beginning. And it starts with kidnapping and 300 years of enslavement, torture, rape, and brutality, and it carries on. And about a quarter of the way in, you see bans on testifying against whites, which made it technically legal to murder black people in this country, and you are now in my lifetime. And, and I, I, I'm going to say it again because I get a lot of white people seem to think it, it ended a long time ago. We are in my lifetime about a quarter of the way through that slide. And then we see about two-thirds of the way through employment discrimination, and we are in 2018 with copious empirical evidence. Right, so let's pick it up there. Employment discrimination, educational discrimination, bias laws and policing practices, white flight, subprime mortgages, mass incarceration, the school to prison pipeline, disproportionate special ed referrals and punishments, testing, tracking, school funding, biased media representation, historical omissions, and so much more. It is a system not an event. It's the system we're in, and none of us could be, and none of us were exempt from its forces. If we want to be unique and special individuals, then we need to figure out how whatever we see is special and different about us set us up into that system, because it did. So I'm talking, I, I know white people really well. I'm talking X, and you're like, huh, I was Y, right? Okay, you were Y, most whites are X. How did Y set you up? It did. The question is not if, it's how. I'm going to repeat it. It's a system, not an event. And how do we cope with the moral trauma of what I just read to you? Resma Menikin has a beautiful book, My Grandmother's Hands, where he talks about racial trauma. The, there's a trauma, I believe, to white people of racism, but I don't think it's, it, it's a different, it's a moral trauma. 
And it's a piece of white fragility, not being able to face our complicity in this system. Well, historically, we projected our sins onto the black body, right? Lazy, shiftless, criminal. <laughs> we projected our sins onto the black body. We got your baby sucking Today, from our kids. in addition kids. to doing that, we <laughs> obscure the system of racism that we uphold, and we exempt ourselves from its forces. Right? And we do this in a way that appears to be progressive, right? That, that race doesn't matter to us. This is um, the board after the grand champion uh, college jeopardy round, right? And for me, it just it just speaks volumes, right? Um, Damn. Not not again knowing our history and being able to trace it into the present is one uh, of the of the volumes it speaks. Wow. Another one is that is the history of this country. It is not their history. It didn't happen in a vacuum. So. One of the aspects of, of institutional power is the ability to disseminate your worldview to everyone, to position it as objective and, and universal, right? Uh, and to tell the story, right? The story of the other when we are not in relationship with the other, right? So I wanna give you an example of the power of the story. Uh, and I wanna do it through the Jackie Robinson story. You all know Jackie Robinson? Right? So Jackie Robinson was, has been quite celebrated for doing something. What's the tagline that goes with Jackie Robinson? The first he, broke the color barrier. He broke the color line. Yeah. Right? Yep. Now, so let's do a little discourse analysis. Okay. Because every, every year on the anniversary, we celebrate uh, him breaking the color line. So think about what that invokes, right? He was exceptional. He was special. He did it. Finally, one of them had what it took to break through okay, and play crazy. with us. Up until him, nobody had what it took. The so subtext, inferior group, right? Narcissism. But he did it. And, of course, the day he did it, the day he broke the color line, racism in sports ended. So imagine if we told a story like this, Jackie Robinson, the first black man that whites allowed to play Major League Baseball. That would be the truth. And I want you to notice the difference in that story. That what, would be the truth. That's the truth. It didn't matter how exceptional he was, and I actually don't believe he was the first most exceptional. Uh, Sad to if, play. Did, if we didn't say he could play, he couldn't play. That's right. If he walked out onto that field before we said you can walk out on the field, the police would have removed him. It wasn't up to and him. And beat him. Right? Now, the reason I want us to tell the story the second way is one, because it's true, and two, because I need role models. Right? H how, did, how did white people get organized? What did they do behind the scene? What barriers did they face? What challenges, right? What strategies did they use? And could we use any of those today and adapt any of those today? Right? It's not about me wanting to point out how bad white people are. So chapter three looks at racism uh, after the civil rights uh, movement. And after the civil rights movement, it made a brilliant adaptation. So post-civil rights, uh, racism got reduced to the following formula. A racist is an individual who consciously does not like people based on race and is intentionally mean to them. Always an individual, must be conscious, must be intentional. And that definition exempts virtually all white people from the system of racism. This definition I believe is the root of virtually all white defensiveness on racism. Have you guys noticed any white defensiveness on racism? Yeah, it, it makes it virtually impossible to talk to the average white person about the inevitable absorption of a racist worldview that we get from being socialist in a racist culture in which white supremacy is the bedrock. Because you suggest that anything I have done is racially problematic in any way, and I'm going to hear a question to my moral character, and I'm going to need to defend my moral character. You know, we've probably seen this a, a million times. Right? So that that definition actually functions to protect racism, even as it looks like 
uh, progress, right? Ra- a racist, racism became bad uh, post civil rights. I know you guys can't read backwards, so. so this this sets up what I think about as the good bad <laughs> binary. Uh, that kind of it's either or, right? Uh, racist or bad, not racist or good, uh, and we know how to fill that in, don't we? Ignorant, bigoted, prejudiced, mean spirited, definitely old. And when we die off, there'll be no more racism. Mm. You know, I've been working with a lot of these uh, tech companies that uh, that when I walk around, I think to myself, God, I guess you have to be under 30 to work here. Um, And I'm telling you, they cannot think critically about race. And the people of color that work with these young people are in so much pain, right? No, I get asked all the time, do you think young people today are less racist? Oh, actually, the question usually begins with, don't you think? It's just a heads up. If you approach me with, don't you think, the answer is no. Because <laughs> that's not an open question. But no, I don't actually think uh, young people today are less racist or, or, uh, because, because their, that consciousness hasn't changed our outcomes. In fact, uh, they're getting worse. Right? Okay, uh, so Southern for sure, don't you think? Around here, I'm pretty sure they live in Fife. <sighs> I've never been to Fife, but on the way to Tacoma, I see Fife. I'm like, ooh, boy, it looks like racists live there. <laughs> and when I'm on way up north, it's like Smoky Point. <laughs> okay? All right. Uh, Not racists are good. We're educated, progressive, open-minded, well-intended. We're young. We're northern. We live on Finney Ridge. But we're all moving to Portland really soon. Because Whole Foods is so corporate now. Uh, again, th- this this is the root of virtually all white defensiveness, and it it just functions so so beautifully to exempt us. So we just we just have to get rid of it. And when white people hear me and they feel angry and pissed off and defensive, can I just say this now that I, you guys are listening to me up? When you laugh at my jokes, I'm gonna keep getting looser and looser. Damn, white people are pissy about racism. We are so pissy on this topic. We're mean on this topic, right? And so if you're sitting here feeling that, just see if it isn't rooted in, if, in this definition. And if you cannot let go of this, you're just not going to be able to move forward. So aversive racism is a form of, of what sociologists call new racism, right? And so it's, it's racism that progressive whites are most likely to hold, um, but because it conflicts with our identities as good people, we're most likely to uh, uh, be in denial about it. So let me find that piece. It's a manifestation of racism that well-intentioned people who see themselves as educated and progressive are more likely to exhibit. It exists under the surface of consciousness because it conflicts with consciously held beliefs of racial equity and justice. Aversive racism is a subtle but insidious form as aversive racists enact racism in ways that allow them to maintain a positive self-image, e.g., I have lots of friends of color, I judge people by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And whites enact racism while maintaining a positive self-image in many ways. For example, rationalizing racial segregation as unfortunate but necessary to access good schools. (laughs) Rationalizing that our workplaces are virtually all white because people of color just don't apply. Avoiding direct racial language and using racially coded terms such as urban, underprivileged, diverse, sketchy, and good neighborhoods. Denying that we have few cross-racial relationships by proclaiming how diverse our community or workplace is. And attributing inequality between whites and people of color to causes other than racism. Consider a conversation I had with a white friend. She was telling me about a white couple who she knew who had just moved to New Orleans and bought a house for a mere $25,000. Of course, she immediately added, they also had to buy a gun, and Joan is afraid to leave the house. I immediately knew they had bought a home in a black neighborhood. This was a moment of white racial bonding between this couple who shared the story of racial danger and my friend, and then between my friend and me as she repeated the story. 
Through this tale, the four of us fortified familiar images of the horror of black space and drew boundaries between us and them without ever having to directly name race or openly express our disdain for black space. Notice that the need for a gun is a key part of this story. It would not have the degree of social capital it holds if the emphasis were on the price of the house alone. Rather, the story's emotional power rests on a why a house would be that cheap. Because it's in a black neighborhood where white people literally might not get out alive. Yet while very negative and stereotypical representations of blacks were reinforced in that exchange, not naming race provided plausible deniability. In fact, in preparing to share this incident, I texted my friend and asked her the name of the city her friends had moved to. I also wanted to confirm my assumption that she was talking about a black neighborhood. I share the text exchange here. Hey, what city did you say your friends had bought a house in for 25,000? She replies, New Orleans. They said they live in a very bad neighborhood and they each have to have a gun to protect themselves. I wouldn't pay five cents for that neighborhood. Mm. I reply, oops, I assume it's a black neighborhood? Yes, you get what you pay for. I'd rather pay 500,000 and live somewhere where I wasn't afraid. I reply, I wasn't asking because I want to live there. I'm writing about this in my book. <laughs> The way that white people talk about race without ever coming out and talking about race. <laughs> she had a very interesting response to that. <laughs> I wouldn't want you to live there because it's too far away from me. Mm. Mm. Notice that when I simply ask what city the house is in, she repeats the story about the neighborhood being so bad that her friends need guns. When I ask if the neighborhood is black, she's comfortable confirming that it is. But when I tell her that I'm interested in how whites talk about race without talking about race, she switches the narrative. Now her concern is about not wanting me to live so far away. This is a classic example Projection. of racism. Gaslighting. Racial disdain that surfaces in daily discourse. Gaslighting. Not being able to admit it because the disdain conflicts with our self image and professed beliefs. Now, readers may be asking themselves, but if the neighborhood is really dangerous, why is acknowledging this danger a sign of racism? Research and implicit bias has shown that perceptions of criminal activity are influenced by race. White people will perceive danger simply by the presence of black people. We cannot trust our perceptions when it comes to race and crime. But regardless of whether the neighborhood is actually more or less dangerous than other neighborhoods, what is salient about this exchange is how it functions race racially and what that means for the white people engaged in it. For my friend and me, this conversation did not increase our awareness of the danger of some specific neighborhood. Rather, the exchange reinforced our fundamental beliefs about black people. Okay. Toni Morrison uses the term race talk to capture, quote, the explicit insertion into everyday life of racial signs and symbols that have no meaning other than positioning African Americans into the lowest level of the racial hierarchy. Unquote. Casual race talk is a key component of white racial framing because it accomplishes the interconnected goals of elevating whites while demeaning people of color. Race talk always implies a racial us and them. So, so folks who have uh, seen, seen me present before know that, that I use this metaphor, and I do tend to think in metaphors. And as I do the work that I do and I talk on a daily basis, basis to white people, I literally got this image in my mind of a dock or a pier. And, and what it signifies for me uh, are two things. One, how, how surface or superficial our, our narratives are. But also the dock, if you look from above, appears to be floating on the water. But it's not. There is an entire structure submerged under the water that props that dock up. It rests on p literally pillars and that's the anchored black into people. the ocean floor. 
That's right. And everything I do in we my work is trying to get country. us off the top of the dock and under there to examine those pillars. Because despite all the we hold up this country on top of the dock, our outcomes have not changed. Right? So we have to ask ourselves, what's going on? So as I listen to these narratives, I think about them in two overall categories, color blind and color celebrate. So let's start with the first set, color blind. Probably the number one color blind racial narrative is, I was taught to treat everyone the same. Anybody ever heard that one? Okay, 